Morning, everybody. Um, so we've done lots of setup. We thought about our trees, which are going to be the sort of continuum object that we're going to be interested in. We set up the right topology to think about convergence with respect to, and we've thought about a framework for our discrete trees that we're going to think about. So now let's introduce the general family of random trees whose scaling limits we're going to study. So my section is random trees and convergence to the Brownian continuum random trees tree. So let me introduce now the notion of a Biennemi tree. So these sometimes get called Galton Watson trees. I'm going to refer to them as Biennemi trees. So these are the family trees of branching processes. Okay. So a sort of classical branching process, we just think about the number of individuals in generation N of some population that's evolving. And I want to think about a bit more structure than that. I want to think about the actual family tree that sits underneath that. Okay, but the idea is the same. Every individual has um, a random number of offspring according to some fixed distribution, which is going to be called the offspring distribution. I'm going to start always with a single progenitor. Okay, so it will have a random number of children, and then each of those children will independently have a random number of children according to this same offspring distribution. And you keep going on in that way until potentially the population dies out, or it might keep growing forever. Okay, so I'm going to write xi for a random variable which takes values in what I'll write as n0. So this is the naturals with zero on the bottom. Okay. So this is going to be representing the number of children of a generic individual in my population. And I'm going to write throughout this section pk for k greater than or equal to zero. This is the probability mass function that corresponds to that distribution. So the probability mass function of xi, so this is the offspring distribution in the usual terminology. Okay, so what I'm going to write now is capital T is going to be the tree which represents this population. Okay, so this is the genealogical tree. Which I'm going to think of as a rooted order tree in the setup that we had in the previous lecture. Okay, so I'm thinking of it as being rooted at the empty set and then having children whose uh, ulam harris labels are simply one digit long, and then the grandchildren have ulam harris labels which are two digits long, and so on and so forth. Okay, so thought of as a rooted ordered tree. Okay. So this has got offspring distribution PK sitting inside of it. Okay, so let me state the theorem, which I'm sure is familiar to everybody in this room, but which I guess you might think of as being the sort of fundamental theorem of branching processes, which is, well, let's suppose that we have genuine randomness in the number of children. So we don't just have always a single offspring because otherwise it's going to be boring. Okay, so in that case... So the probability that this family tree is finite is one if and only if the expectation of the offspring random variable is at most one. Okay, so the, process, the population dies out with probability one if and only if the expected offspring is at most one. Okay, and I'm sure that's pretty much familiar to everybody. Okay, so let me just note one other sort of basic fact. I'm not going to prove this one. Okay, so we have that the probability that I generate a particular tree, T, a particular rooted order tree, so this is just the product over the vertices in the tree, 
of the probability mass function evaluated at, well, however many children that vertex has. And this is just stemming from this independence property. So different individuals are reproducing independently of one another. And so I just get that product form. So this is for t in the set of rooted ordered trees. OK, so I'm going to be interested in conditioning my tree to have size precisely n. Okay, so we're going to be interested in conditioning on the event that the tree has size precisely n, and then I'm going to be thinking about sending n to infinity. OK, so first thing to observe is this is not an event that will necessarily have strictly positive probability for every n. Right, so depending on your offspring distribution, for example, if I have a binary tree where everybody has two or zero offspring, then I'm only ever going to generate odd tree sizes. And so the probability of having size equal to an even number is zero. OK, so in that case, let me sort of implicitly think of conditioning on this down a subsequence of values that makes sense, okay, where we actually have positive probability of achieving that. OK, so I'm going to write tn for the conditioned tree. OK, so recall from the last lecture that we saw that there were different functional encodings of rooted ordered trees. So we saw the height process and the Wukasiewicz path. OK, and we observed or proved in particular that Wukasiewicz paths, or rather paths which have the shape of a Wukasiewicz path, are in bijection with rooted ordered trees. And an immediate consequence of that is that we can characterize the Wukasiewicz path of such a random tree. And we do that as follows. So this is Proposition 4.3 in the notes. So... Oops. Yeah. So we can see if it's passed. So I'm now going to write this with a capital XN, okay, to indicate that this is now a random process. Okay, the N is indicating that we're conditioning our tree to have size N. So the Wikasiewicz path of this random tree TN, which I've conditioned to have size N. So this has the same distribution as a random walk. as a random walk, so x of k, say, run for n steps, started from 0. Okay, so remember, our Wukasiewicz path always started from 0 with step distribution. So remember that we added on number of children minus one in the Wukasiewicz path. So what I need to do is I need to shift the offspring distribution by one. So the effect of that is I end up looking at pk plus one for values of k which are greater than or equal to minus one. So my path can make down steps of one whenever I see a, an individual with zero children. Okay, and conditioned on tau equals n, where tau is the first hitting time of minus 1. Sorry, k greater than or equal to 0, such that xk is equal to minus 1. OK, so the conditioning the size of the tree, right? So let's think unconditioned for a start. OK, so if I just took an unconditioned Bienname tree, Okay, and you think about going around and exploring the tree as we did in the usual way for the Wukasiewicz path, then we're just encountering IID copies of the offspring distribution. Okay, so every time we encounter a new vertex, we add on its number of children minus one. So that's giving us a step which indeed has this distribution. But what do we want? We want it to be the case that we first hit minus one at time n. OK, that's precisely the same thing as saying we've conditioned our tree to have size n. OK, and so for the random walk, that conditioning becomes precisely that this first hitting time of minus one occurs precisely at time n. OK, so the bijection gives us this theorem 
in the random setting. Okay, so we can immediately read off this quite a nice relationship for this distribution of the size of the tree. All right, so immediate consequence If I want to think about the probability of this event that the tree has size n, well, that's exactly the same as the probability that the first hitting time of minus 1 for my random walk is equal to n. OK. And this is fortunately a random variable that's been quite well studied. So let me see if I can manage to use this thing. <laughs> Apparently not, or at least not with only one hand. <laughs> OK, so I want to spend a little bit of time now thinking about this probability that tau equals n. OK. So... Let me start by stating a combinatorial lemma, which is going to be very useful to us in understanding this probability. OK, so let me say for a sequence, so this is going to be just a sequence of integers in a moment, but let me set it up in general. So for a sequence x, which is x1, x2, up to xn. So let me think of these as being the step sizes of a walk. So for the moment, everything's deterministic. In a moment, I'm going to make it random and it will be a random walk. But for the moment, let me just think about a deterministic walk. So let's let s of 0 be 0. So I'm going to pin my walk to start at 0. And I'm going to get s of j just by summing up the first j of these i's, uh, xi's. OK. OK, so these are the, this is a, a walk with steps x, let's say. OK, so let me now state the cycle lemma. OK, so this is a combinatorial fact. It's sometimes called the otter dwarf formula. So I want to restrict the set of step sizes that I'm going to allow, and I want them to be things that might possibly be steps of a Wukasiewicz path. Right? So in particular, I want my x's to take values in the set minus 1, 0, 1, and then so on, arbitrarily large. Okay, so suppose my x is a sequence taking values in, so minus 1, 0, 1, 2, and so on. OK. And let me suppose also that if I sum up all of my xi's, so there are n of them in total, then I get minus k for some k which is between 1 and n. OK. So, in particular, if we're thinking about our Wukasiewicz path, remember that we're always ending up at minus 1. So, in a moment, I'm going to apply this with k being equal to 1, although later I'm going to want to apply it with a general k. So, that's why I'm stating the general version. OK. So, I've got this sequence of values here, and what I want to do is think about taking cyclic shifts of this sequence of values. Right? So, I can shift them along and sort of bring these ones around the front. So let's let the vector xi be the ith shift. So that's the vector which starts xi plus 1, xi plus 2, goes all the way up to xn, and then cycles back round starting from x1. OK, so it's just a cyclic shift of the values of x. OK, so then the statement is, 
there are precisely k values of i such that the walk with uh, steps xi hits minus k for the first time at time n. So it hits minus k for the first time at time n. Okay. So let's think about what this is saying in the case k equals 1, because that's where I'm about to apply it. And in some sense, that's the most important one to understand. Okay, so I've got a sequence of values taking their values in this set, okay, such that when I add them up, what I'm getting is minus 1. Okay, and so in general, what's that going to do? If I think about an arbitrary search walk, it might go below, but it's got to end up at minus 1. Okay, and so the idea is that by shifting, by doing a cyclic shift of these values, I should be able to find some walk which hits minus 1 for the first time at time n. Okay, and then that's a suitable Wikasiewicz path, right? We want something that's going to hit minus one for the first time at time n. We don't want it to go below zero before that. Okay, so I'm not going to prove this. This is something that it's very easy to find a proof of. But I'm going to apply it immediately in this context that I'm interested in. Let me try and do this okay. Oh, I may have made it too wet now. Okay, so the consequence of this that I'm going to use, is that legible? Good. Okay, so the consequence is, so firstly, what am I thinking about now? I want to apply this in a situation where my steps, these are going to be offspring random variable minus one. Right at each step, those are the that's the, the random walk that I'm interested in. Is something whose step sizes are offspring random variable minus one. Okay, so if I condition, so to have precisely, uh, where was it, <laughs> this property? So I want the sum of those step sizes to be minus one. Okay, so what I'd like to do is I'd like to compare the probability of that event to the probability of hitting minus one for the first time at time n. Okay, so firstly, if I condition on this event that this is equal to minus one, or equivalently that the sum of the psi i's is equal to n minus one, same thing, Okay, then my step random variables are exchangeable. Okay, so they're no longer independent because I've conditioned their sum to be equal to something, but they're still exchangeable. So if I relabel, I don't change the distribution. Okay, and moreover, there exists precisely one cyclic shift. such that the walk with those steps hits minus one for the first time at time n. 
okay, so in particular, what's the probability that I happen to have generated the correct cyclic shift from the get-go? Well, by symmetry, it must be one on n, right? With probability one on n, I happen to get lucky and I got the right one first time, and otherwise with probability n minus one on n, I need to shift to some other position as a starting point. So in particular, what that tells me, so the shift is the identity with probability one on n, And so in particular, the probability that my tree has size n, so we already saw that that was the probability that we hit minus 1 for the first time at time n, well, that's the same as 1 on n times the probability that the sum of my psi i's is equal to n minus 1. Okay. Right, so this is the probability that some of my xi i's is n minus 1, and conditionally on that event, the probability that the walk with steps xi 1 minus 1, xi 2 minus 1, all the way up to xi n minus 1, <laughs> happens to hit minus 1 for the first time at time n, that has probability just 1 on n, okay, by symmetry. Okay, so this enables us to get at this probability quite nicely, because now I'm thinking about a probability that a sum of iid random variables takes a particular value. Okay, and this is the sort of thing that probabilists have put an awful lot of effort into trying to understand. And so let me state then, uh, in a moment, just the, the theorem I'm going to use about the asymptotics of this. So let me start by making an observation. So... These random variables here, well, let's assume that they have a finite mean. Okay, so what's the most likely value to be taken by this sum? Well, it's sort of, roughly speaking, let's think about the law of large numbers, it wants to be somewhere close to its mean. Right, so this wants to be something like n times the mean of psi i. So if I think about how would I maximise the probability of this let's say, relatively low probability event, right? I'm asking to take a particular value. Okay, if I want to maximise that probability, I should be thinking about taking these guys to have mean roughly one. Okay? And then that's indeed the case. That's where this probability is generally maximised. So there's an exercise in the notes to precisely explore this issue of where do I maximise this probability. And it turns out that under sort of reasonable conditions, this is a probability which is exponentially small if your mean is away from one, and polynomially small if you're at one for the mean. Okay, and again, so there's a, a nice exercise in the notes to explain that. So the idea is going to be that if we want to maximise this probability, we should think about taking the mean to be one. Okay, so that's my sort of slightly hand-wavy motivation for taking the case psi equal, uh, expectation of psi equals one from now on. So from now on... We're going to consider expectation of psi is equal to 1, and I'm also going to allow myself a finite variance. Okay, so if the variance is infinite, there's a different parallel story that you can tell here, but I want to tell you the kind of simplest version of the story first, and in my final lecture, I'll talk a little bit about what happens when you don't have a finite variance. Okay, so the theorem that I'm going to apply here is the local limit theorem. So let me give you a statement of that in the case that I'm going to use it. Okay, so this is a local version of the central limit theorem. If you haven't seen it before, it's a really useful thing to know about. So I'm going to take this situation where my psi's have mean 1. So this is a funny way of writing the expectation of psi minus 1 is equal to 0, right? That's really what I'm thinking of here. Okay. The variance of psi is finite. Let's call it sigma squared, so we've got some notation. Okay, and let me also assume for simplicity that the greatest common divisor of the set of i's such that pi is strictly zero, uh, sorry, is strictly positive, is equal to one. So this gets rid of this problem that I mentioned earlier, that the event on which we're conditioning might not have strictly positive probability. So this tells me that that will have strictly positive probability, at least for all large enough n. And that's all I care about because I'm doing asymptotics. Okay, so then under these conditions... We have that the largest value over the whole of Z, 
of the following thing. So I'm going to take the square root of n times the probability. So this is my random walk, which has step sizes, psi minus 1 in distribution. So the probability that that equals k minus, well, what should I be expecting here? The clues in the name. This is a sort of local version of the central limit theorem. I'm going to compare to the standard Gaussian density. Or well, actually not the standard one. So here I've got a mean zero quantity, right, because my steps are psi minus one, but I've still got this variance hanging around. So I'm going to compare to the density of normal zero sigma squared. OK, so that should get me a square root of 2 pi sigma squared on the bottom, e to the minus k squared on 2n sigma squared. OK, and the remarkable fact is that this goes to zero uniformly in k. Okay. So if you think about moving this square root of n onto the bottom, this is roughly what this thing should look like asymptotically if I'm converging in distribution to a random variable that has the normal naught sigma squared density. Okay. I need both hands. <laughs> okay, so how does this help with the thing that I'm interested in? Well, Oh, right, OK, so the point is that I can't expect this thing to be looking like a nice, smooth quantity if it's got zeros all over the place. Right, so <laughs> I want something that's, that's going to work uniformly in k, but if I've got certain values of k that I can't take that value, right, intuitively speaking, I'm really sitting on some sublattice rather than on z. OK, and in fact, the effect is to multiply this by whatever the lattice spacing is to make up for the fact that this thing isn't very even, right? So in fact, you know, I'm still going to get, if you think about the central limit theorem, you're still going to get convergence in distribution to the relevant normal distribution. But sort of at the local level, you get these sort of gaps, right, to deal with this sort of lattice effect. OK, so there is a more general version of this theorem. I'm just, I'm just stating the simplest version of it, just because it's easiest. Yeah, so this, it ensures that that's something that has positive probability, okay, which makes all of this story easier to tell. And it's perfectly possible to get around that by using a more general version of the local limit theorem, but I sort of don't want to get into those complications here. It's just notationally messy. Okay, so the corollary of this is that under the same conditions, this probability that mod t equals n, so this is asymptotic to 1 on, so what do I get? So I'm thinking about now the probability that xn equals minus 1. Okay, so what happens when I put in minus 1 here? Well, I'm getting something up here in the exponent, which is like order 1 on n, right? So that's going to vanish as n goes to infinity. I'm just going to be thinking about having a 1 here. So all that's going to come out, really, is just this normalizing constant in the normal density. So remember that I've got a factor of 1 on n coming from the cycle lemma. Okay, so rather than something which is asymptotic to square root of n, I'm getting 1 on n to the 3 halves. Right, so I get extra factor of n, and the constants look like this. Okay, so indeed, I've got this sort of polynomial decay to 0 rather than an exponential decay in n. Okay, and it turns out that for well-behaved families of offspring distributions, it's in fact the case that if you take a subcritical um, got what's a, uh, sorry, Biennium uh, tree or a supercritical one that's got the right 
offspring distribution regularity, then in fact, conditioning to have size n sort of brings you back, in fact, to this critical setting. So I'm not actually losing very much generality. So that's explored in greater detail in the exercise in the notes. So I think that from a probabilist perspective, conditioned branching process trees are, are perhaps the most natural model of random trees. But of course, lots of people who are interested in random trees are in fact combinatorialists. And they want to think about typical properties of trees chosen from a particular set of trees. So what's nice about this model is that it actually encapsulate, uh, encapsulates many natural combinatorial models of random trees if you just think about it the right way. And again, there are a couple of exercises in the notes that I've put in specifically to explore that aspect of things, that this model really does encapsulate natural combinatorial models of random trees, as well as being sort of probabilistically natural. So I'm going to leave that as something for you to explore. Very happy to discuss that with anybody who wants to come and talk to me. So what I'd like to do now is think about some other sort of basic properties of these trees, which I'm going to use when I come to the proof of the convergence theorem. So I want to start just by thinking about a decomposition at the root. So one of the beautiful things about branching process trees from a probabilist perspective is that you've got this nice recursive property. Right? So if you think about the unconditioned tree and you start at the root, then you've got a random number of offspring and each of those is the root of its own little branching process tree. So you've got this nice self-similarity property. When you condition to have size n, of course, you lose that nice independence, right? Because everything's got to sum to n in the end. But you've still got a sort of version of this nice recursive decomposition of the root. And that's what I want to talk about now because I'm going to use it. So let me have a subsection decomposition at the root. Okay. So let me write cn for the number of children of the root in my condition tree. Okay, so I've got my root, which again we're going to call empty set, and I've got some random number of children, so let me draw three. Okay, so these are one, two, and three in the Ulam Harris notation. And then I've got three subtrees which descend from each of those individuals. So let, let's give notation for the sizes. Let me call NN1 the size of the subtree coming from the first child, NN2 for the size of the subtree coming from the second, and so on and so forth. So in general, these go up to NNCN for whatever CN happens to be. OK, so let me observe immediately that if I sum over these guys, then I'm getting n minus 1, right? So there's a single individual at the root, which I'm not counting, and everybody else is in one of these subtrees. OK, and again, if I condition on Cn, these random variables are exchangeable, OK? So they're invariant under, ran under relabeling. So nn1 up to nncn are exchangeable. <coughs> And that's going to be really useful. So let me write down some explicit probabilities for these things. So let me take some numbers, n1, n2, up to nk, which sum to n minus 1. OK. So what's the probability that I generate, so a tree 
which has precisely k children of the root, and then which is such that nn1 is equal to n1 up to nnk is equal to nk. OK, so this should be straightforward to do now that we've got this interpretation in terms of hitting times for random walks. So this is, firstly, I need the probability that xi is k, right? So this is just telling me the probability unconditioned that the root has precisely k children. OK, then I need a first copy of the hitting time of minus 1 to be equal to n1 times the probability that a kth copy is equal to minus, uh, is equal to n, divided by, so this is the, the conditioning event, the probability that just a copy of tau is equal to n. Okay, so this is the probability of the intersection of all of these things. Um, and of course, it's implicit if I've got these guys summing to n minus 1, then the tree has size n. So I don't need to include that in the event, it's implicit. Okay, and this is me dividing by the event on which the probability of the event on which I'm conditioning. Okay, where I should have said tau 1, tau 2, up to tau k are simply iid copies of tau. Okay, so each of these things is a little BNMA tree on its own. And I'm asking, what's the probability that tree has size ni for the relevant i? Okay, and that's precisely, again, the probability that this hitting time of minus 1 is equal to the relative, relevant thing. Okay, so I want to think about what happens to the distribution of cn as n goes to infinity. So this is something I expect a lot of people have seen before, but I want to reprove it here because I'm going to make quite essential use of it in a moment. So in order to do so, let me make one more the definition. So let me let psi hat have the size biased version of the distribution of psi. So don't worry if that's not something you've met before. So let me give a definition then. So i.e. the probability that psi hat is equal to k is k times the probability that psi equals k divided by the mean of psi. OK, so this is a general definition of the size bias distribution associated with a random variable. OK, so what do I do? I just want to bias the distribution towards larger values of k. OK, and... I can do that here because this is a random variable that has finite mean. And so in particular, this is a thing that's still going to sum to 1. OK, so notice my original random variable took values greater than or equal to 0, but this only takes values which are 1 or higher. OK, so in particular, I've got probability 0 of taking 0. OK, now, of course, I assume that my mean here was equal to 1. And so this is particularly simple in this case. I just get k times pk. So let me put that here. OK. So I think this is lemma 4.7 in the notes. So the number of children of the root converges in distribution to the size biased offspring distribution, okay, along with the convergence of its mean. So its mean is going to converge to whatever the mean of the size biased random variable is, which you can check is sigma squared plus one. And if also we have that the original random variable has a finite third moment, then we also get convergence of the second moment of this thing. To so the second moment of the size biased random variable. So what's the second moment of the size biased random variable? Well, that's the third moment of the original random variable. <laughs> 
to give myself a bit of space to do the proof in. Okay, so what's going on here, at least intuitively? Well, it can't be that the degree of the root is looking particularly typical, right? Because I've conditioned my tree to have size n. Let's assume that n is 2 or greater, just to make this argument make some sense. Okay, then the root is going to have to have at least one child, because otherwise we can't fill in the rest of the tree. Okay, so that's dragging it to being greater, certainly. And then the effect then goes to infinity, right? I need to create a tree which is getting larger and larger and larger. And so increasingly what it's feeling like is I need to condition this thing to be what I would get if I was in fact conditioning the tree to be infinite. So those who've seen the local limit of a Bienheimer tree, this is precisely that result that what you're ending up with in the limit is the size biased offspring random variable at the root. Okay. <coughs> But let me prove this bare hands because I think it's a useful thing to have seen. So even if you're not aware of the sort of local limit theory, this is, I think, still um, something you should be able to understand. This is a very bare hands proof. Um, so let me call this thing star. Okay, so I'm just going to use this explicit distribution that I've written down here. Okay, so my star... I can write the probability that Cn is equal to k as precisely the following thing. So I've still got this probability that psi equals k, but now I'm multiplying by, so what do I need to do? I need to sum over all the possible values of n1 up to nk, which sum to n minus 1. And the effect of that is just going to be that I end up with the probability that tau1 up to tau k sum to n minus 1. Okay, so that just gives me the sum of tau 1 up to tau k is equal to n minus 1. And then, of course, I'm still dividing by the probability that tau equals n. Okay. So now let's make an observation about this random walk that we're dealing with. So tau 1 is a copy of the first hitting time of minus 1. Okay, and tau 2 is another copy of the first hitting time of minus 1. But if you think about just keeping running your random walk, okay, because the largest step it can make down is of minus 1, in fact, what this is looking like precisely is the first hitting time of minus k for the random walk. Okay, does that make sense? Because I have to first go to minus 1, then I've got the strong Markov property, right? So it's just like I'm starting over, but from minus 1 rather than from 0, and asking for what's the first time until I hit minus 2. And then strong Markov property again, and I keep going until I hit minus k. Okay, so this has the same distribution as the first hitting time of minus k. And in particular, that means I'm again thinking about something that falls into this um, framework of the cycle lemma, right? Because I'm now thinking about the first hitting time of minus k for a random walk whose step sizes are offspring distribution minus 1. And what did the cycle lemma say? It said that there were precisely k cyclic shifts, which would give me hitting minus k for the first time at time n. Okay? And so in particular... Well, I've got n minus 1 here, but n minus 1n, it's not going to make very much difference in the limit. Okay, so in particular, this is going to be probability psi equals k times, so k on n minus 1, in fact, because I'm now asking for this to occur at time n minus 1 rather than n, times the probability that my random walk at time n minus 1 is equal to minus k divided by, and I can do the same thing on the bottom, except this is genuinely just the first hitting time of minus 1 now, so this gives me a 1 on n times the probability that x of n is equal to minus 1. Okay, so that's just by two applications of the cycle lemma. Okay, so what I want to do is I want to absorb this into this probability mass function here, and that's where the size bias distribution is coming out. So this is giving me probability that psi hat is equal to k. 
What have I else have I got hanging around? I've got a factor of n on n minus 1, which is obviously not going to be harmful as n goes to infinity. Question. Question. Uh, it should be n minus k, thank you. Oh, uh, no, sorry, this, is the, this happens for the first time at time n minus 1. So uh, if you think about these, so this is the sum of the sizes of the subtrees. Yes. Right, so they need to sum to n minus 1. Oh, okay, because you are counting that also. Okay, yeah, yes. that makes sense. Okay, so I've got a completely unharmful factor of n on n minus 1, and then I've got a ratio of two probabilities. So I've got this xn minus 1 is equal to minus k, and I've got probability that x of n is equal to minus 1. But I'm looking for a convergence in distribution here, right? So I'm happy to take k fixed, okay? And so for fixed k, well, you know, minus k, minus 1, I don't really care. I'm still going to pick out just the constant in the, stand, in the normal density, okay? So what I'm actually getting here is a ratio which converges to 1 as n goes to infinity. Oops, she's just losing her bits of paper. All right, so this is just going to converge to 1 by the local limit theorem. Okay, this obviously goes to 1, and so what I get left with is the probability that psi hat is equal to k. So this is indeed the size-biased offspring distribution. Okay, so I also claimed that we had the convergence of kind of as many moments... Sorry, Eleanor, go for it. It's one, so I'm taking the, the, the critical offspring distribution, so it's one. Yeah, exactly. No, no, please do keep asking. Um. Uh, it seems that uh, when you are like, fixing the total, num total progeny of the trees, and it refers that uh, the root has more children than it usually should have. Exactly. So, do you ha I mean, what is the intuition behind that? So we need to get this tree to get unusually large, right? So this is an event who's got, which has vanishing probability, right? The probability is going to zero as n, as n tends to infinity. And so in particular, we want it to do something it doesn't naturally do, right? Which is get up to this height, right? And so if you like, this is sort of asking what is the most likely way to achieve that, mm -hmm. right? And the way it achieves it is by having this size-biased offspring at the root. Yeah. And indeed, there's, a, you know, there's a, a more detailed version of this picture which says that this thing grows an infinite spine which has size-biased offspring along it and then standard BNMA trees just glued on off sideways. I don't want to go into the full picture, but that's certainly something which one can do. Okay, so I claimed that we also had the convergence of the moments here, and that's also straightforward because, in fact... Another consequence of the local limit theorem is that this guy is uniformly bounded above by some constant, okay? And in particular, that's enough to get that we can apply the dominated convergence theorem. Okay, so again, by the local limit theorem, we in fact have that this is uniformly bounded, so there exists a constant A which is strictly positive, such that the probability that Cn is equal to k is actually bounded above by constant times the size-biased probability mass function. Okay, and that gives the convergence of the moments whenever I've got the appropriate moment of psi hat. Let me write that on a clean bit of board. And the convergence of the moments follows straightforwardly.
Okay. So uh, mm -hmm. you can apply again also this argument to all max nodes. Yeah, so essentially as long as I go sort of finite distance from the root, I can sort of come up with a version of the same argument. So we need to think a little bit about how many vertices there are in each of the subtrees. So actually that brings me on to exactly what I was going to do next. So that's very, very nice of you to say that. So we've seen that we've got a sort of size bias number of offspring, roughly speaking, coming off the root, at least as, it, as n gets large, we're looking approximately like the size bias offspring distribution. How about the numbers of vertices falling in each of these subtrees? Okay, so I've got Cn of these subtrees. How many vertices fall into each of them? And it turns out to be the case that typically what you get is one very large subtree, which contains a proportion essentially one of all of the vertices, and then some tiny stuff. Okay, so this is a very uneven mass split among the children of the root. So let me make a formal statement of that. Okay, so let me fix some gamma strictly bigger than one. So one way of thinking about this is if I look at the expectation of the sum from one to Cn of, this is the proportion of vertices roughly. I could divide by n minus one to get a proper proportion, but you'll believe me that that doesn't make very much difference here. So if I take roughly the proportion of the vertices that fall in the ith subtree coming from the root, and I raise that to the power gamma, then in fact that converges to one as n goes to infinity. So what this is saying is effectively, actually we're ending up with all of the mass in a single one of these subtrees. Okay, that's one way of seeing it. Okay, and moreover, there exists some constant k gamma, strictly positive, such that, well, you can ask what's the probability that we don't get this event where everything is essentially ending up in one subtree? How unlikely is it that I get two or more macroscopic subtrees coming off the root? And that turns out to be an event which has probability roughly one on square root of n. Okay, so what I'm going to give you is a weak statement of that fact. One can make a much stronger version of that statement, but I'm not going to need it for what comes next. So one version of that statement is that if I take the limit as n goes to infinity of square root of n times 1 minus this quantity here, then that limit is bounded below by a strictly positive constant. Okay. So let's try and read what this says. So firstly, this random variable is just deterministically bounded above by one. Right? These guys sum to n minus one. I'm raising them to a power strictly bigger than one. Okay? So this whole quantity is just deterministically bounded above by one. Right? And we've got its expectation is tending to one. So we can ask, well, how much below one can we possibly be? And what do we need to scale by in order to actually see that effect? And the answer is we need to rescale by square root of n. Okay? So it is in fact the case that this thing has a limit. Right? So this in fact tends to some constant value, but that takes a bit more proving. And so I thought I would give you a sort of soft version of the argument, if you see what I mean, which I've put in the notes. So for the moment on the board, I'm just going to prove this one, but this is a sort of refinement of it that says, well, what's the error term? Okay. So let me prove, let me call this statement one, and that one's two. So 
proof of one. Okay, so I first want to do a little bit of truncating of my distributions just to make the argument a little bit easier. So let me fix an epsilon which is strictly positive. And let me take L to be sufficiently large that if I look at the probability that my size bias random variable is at most L, then that's at least 1 minus epsilon on 2. Okay, so this is some value such that all, that, all but epsilon 2 of the probability mass is below L. Okay, this is a finite random variable, so I can do that. And let's also take M sufficiently large. Then I've got the same property for the sum of the first L minus 1 copies of tau. That for that L i.e. the one which gives me this, I have that the probability that tau 1 plus tau L minus 1 is at most m is greater than or equal to 1 minus epsilon on 2. So again, it's a finite random variable, so I can do that. So this is just so that in a moment, I can manipulate finite sums rather than infinite sums. Okay, it's just a little bit of sort of truncation. Okay, so by exchangeability and I suppose the linearity of the expectation, if I think about this expectation here of the sum of these n, n, i on n to the gammas, so this is the sum from 1 to c, n, well, each of these guys is playing exactly the same role. So this is exactly the same as the expectation of c, n, times the first one. Okay. And this is something that I've got an explicit probability mass function for, right? So I'm just going to write down what the expectation is in terms of that probability mass function. Okay, so I think I need a little bit more space, so let me not try to squeeze it in the bottom of the board, but put it over here. Uh, okay, I'll try not to erase the theorem yet. Maybe let me erase the bottom bit. Okay, so because I've got these little sort of cutoffs here, I'm going to allow myself to do a lower bound. Okay, I've got an upper bound of one already, so I'm not too worried about. I've got a nice sandwiching that I've already got for free. Okay, so this is bounded below by. So I first want the sum over possible values that C n might take. Okay, so I've got a k coming from the cn in my expectation. I've got the probability that xi equals k. And then I need my sum over, let's say, j. Okay. And let me actually, rather than summing over the values that nn1 would take, let me sum over 1 minus that. So let me sum over n minus something. It's going to be more convenient. So... This is the sum from k minus 1 up to m of n minus 1 minus j divided by n to the power gamma. And then I need the rest of the probability mass function. So I need the bit of the probability mass function that corresponds to n n 1. So that's one copy of tau. And I'm thinking about this tau 1 being equal to n minus 1 minus j. Okay, and I've summed over the possible values that J might take, except that I've cut off at M rather than at infinity. Okay. And then I've got the rest. So this is tau 2 up to tau K. 
is equal to j. And then, of course, I need my normalization factor, which is, again, just the probability tau equals n. So that's just using, that's just putting in, calculating the expectation using the probability mass function that we had before. So this was by star, which, unfortunately, I've rubbed off the board, but which is maybe in your handwritten notes if you're making them. OK, so I'm happy with lower bounds here. So let's make this as bad as possible for ourselves by taking the largest possible value of j here, which would be m. Okay. But then it's no longer being summed over, and I can pull it out the front. So. OK, so this argument is only going to work when n is bigger than m plus 1. But that's fine. I'm interested in n going to infinity. So that's, m is just some fixed thing that I took at the start. Okay. So I get this to the power gamma. I've got the sum from k equals 1 to L of my uh, psi hat distribution just by putting these two things together. Okay, and then what have I got here now? I've got the sum from j equals k minus 1 up to m um, of, so probability, let's bring out this term first. So I want the sum of these guys to be j, okay? And then I'm going to have a ratio of the probability that tau 1 is equal to n minus 1 minus j to the probability that tau is equal to n. Right. So the only n dependence now is in this factor here, right? And remember that we've again got this uniform uh, estimation that's coming from the local limit theorem. And so it's the case that uniformly in j varying between k minus 1 and m, it's the case that this thing is going to 1. Okay, so that's going to 1 by the local limit theorem again. So this whole thing here, this thing is obviously going to 1, and I'm just going to get left with this thing here. Okay, and let me convert this into being, these guys are just IID copies of this first hitting time of minus one, so I can relabel them without costing myself anything. Okay, and that's all I've got left. Okay, and indeed, this thing here, well, I can reinterpret this just as the probability that these guys sum to at most M. Right, so I'm just summing over the probability mass function up until some point, and so that gives me this m here. Okay. And then, well, I only make matters worse for myself if I take k bigger, right? These are all non-negative random variables, so this probability gets smaller when I take more of the summands, and so indeed it's the case that this is less than, or greater than or equal to, so this is then, that enables me to pull this out, and I'm just getting the probability that psi hat is at most L times the probability that tau 1 up to tau m minus 1, say, well, let's say tau m, let's make it even worse for ourselves, uh, tau, sorry, L minus 1 is at most m. Okay, and so by my assumptions over there, this thing here is at most 1 minus epsilon. Okay, but epsilon was arbitrary, and so the result follows. So that's a sort of quick bare hands proof that really almost all of the mass typically is ending up in one of the subtrees. Okay. So this is really just this sort of interplay between these guys here. Right? And what we're saying is that this probability is really, you know, in the limit, all we're seeing is just one of these things dominating. Right? So it's really just coming out of this kind of local limit thing. Okay. Right, so I've got, I think, about sort of 20 minutes left, if I've calculated correctly. 
So I think that's just enough time to talk you through, but not give any sort of proof of the convergence to the Brownian continuum random tree. Right, so let's see how far we go. Get rid of this. Okay, so we've seen that the Wachowskiewicz path that we're associating with one of these critical BNMA trees. Sorry, Meltem, you've got a question. It can be L minus one. I've made my life worse by making it L. That was, I think, what I took as. Did I take? I can't remember what I took as a assumption. If it was L minus one, let's have L minus one. Doesn't matter. Just some cap. Okay, so we saw that the Wachowskiewicz path of our BNMA tree, which is critical, is just a random walk excursion that we've conditioned to reach minus one for the first time at time n. Okay, so it should feel reasonably obvious, or at least reasonably intuitive, that we're getting something like a Brownian motion if we rescale correctly. Right, so this is an excursion of a mean zero random walk. We've got finite variant step sizes, so there should be something Brownian going on here in the limit. Okay, so that is indeed the case. And this is a sort of variant of Donsker's theorem, which I think is due to K. Okay, so let me state it in the specific setting that we've got, but this is, of course, a more general statement for random walks which are, have centered step sizes with finite variants. So let me take the variance to be sigma squared, and let me emphasize that I want this to be some strictly positive but finite value. Okay. So then it's the case that if I do the usual central limit theorem scaling, or Donsker's theorem scaling, so I need to get rid of the standard deviation also. Okay. So if I just took my random walk unconditioned, then this would be the right scaling to get a Brownian motion. Okay. But I've got this conditioning to hit minus one for the first time at time n. All that ends up giving me is instead convergence in distribution to the normalized Brownian excursion. Okay, so the way I've set things up, I'm thinking about this, so I've taken the floor of NT as a way of interpolating between different integer time points. Okay, so that's giving me a thing which is sort of a step function. So it's not a continuous function, so I haven't got convergence in the space of continuous functions. Let's say we've got convergence in the Skorohod space. Okay, but let me emphasize that the limit object here is continuous. Okay, so this is in, let's say, D01 R plus. Okay, so that's the Skorohod space with the Skorohod topology. Okay, so I'm not going to prove this because I think it's reasonable for me to say that this is a sort of classical theorem from stochastic analysis. But what I do want to spend some time on is how we get from this to and proof of the convergence of the actual tree, because I think that's sort of much more in the spirit of this course. So I want to deal with the geometry of the tree here, and I'd like, rather than the Wachowskiewicz path, it's going to be easier for me to work with the height process. So remember, we had this nice comparison between the graph distance in the tree and something that looked like the way we got a real tree, an R tree, out of the height process with a little bit of an error. Okay, so we saw that in the last lecture. And I'd like to make use of that result. But in order to do so, I need to get from X to H. Okay, and so in fact, most of the work in this theorem is showing that you can do that. Okay, so 
So I'm going to write Hn of k for the height process that's associated with this tree. OK, so the height process is naturally defined up to time n minus 1. Let me extend it to time n just by putting a 0 on the end, because then I don't have to worry about an kind of annoying edge effects. Is the, so height function of the random tree, so let me call it a height process. Okay, so theorem 412, which is originally due to Marker and Mokadem under an exponential moment condition for the offspring distribution of the tree, and then extended by Lugal, So let me attribute it to both. So the result is that jointly, if I think about what's going on with my Wikesiewicz path and my height process simultaneously, and again, I'm going to use the same way of interpolating between integer points. It doesn't really matter what you do, because in both cases, we're going to have a continuous limit. So if you want to take a linear interpolation instead of this sort of step function thing, that's fine. So if I look at this pair of paths, then they converge jointly in distribution as n goes to infinity to... So we already know what the first one tends to. So I've put the sigma up the top now, okay, before I had it divided. So I get sigma times the normalized Brownian excursion. And in the second coordinate, I get 2 on sigma times the same normalized Brownian excursion. So again, in the square hot sense, if you want. Okay. So although these things at the finite scale look a little bit different from one another, in the limit, they're actually only a constant factor apart. So this is kind of remarkable. These two things are actually, roughly speaking, the same object in the limit, despite the fact that the way we got at them was rather different. OK, so we're going to spend quite a bit of time thinking about why these things are similar. OK, and that's certainly going to be sort of most of the content of tomorrow's lecture, I expect. But before we turn to the proof of this theorem, what I'd like to do is show how it gives you the convergence to the Brownian continuum random tree. OK, so let me state the theorem here and then I'll try and prove it there. OK, so if I take my tree Tn, OK, again, I'm thinking about this as its vertex set. OK, I'm going to, because I've got some sigmas floating around here, let me take uh, sigma on square root of n. OK, so I want to end up with a 2 on sigma uh, for the height process. So this turns out to be the right thing to do to the graph distance. So remember, by convention, I'm taking the graph distance to be on whichever set I happen to have in front of it. Okay. And again, I'm going to take the uniform measure on the vertices. Okay. So I've got n vertices in my tree, so that's just mass 1 on n on each vertex. Okay. So then the statement is that this converges in distribution as n goes to infinity to my Brownian continuum random tree with its uniform measure, okay, um, with respect to the GHP topology. Okay, so like I say, the hard bit of all of this is this part here. So what I want to do here is just show you that how we can get a nice correspondence and coupling so that this proof of this theorem is actually quite straightforward. So. Okay. 
so the first thing I'm going to say is I have Skorohod's representation theorem available to me. I'm, saying, I'm going to start by saying there exists some probability space on which this convergence is almost sure. There exists a probability space on which the convergence in distribution in theorem 4.12 is almost sure. So let's work on this probability space. So let me emphasize we have absolutely no idea how different n's relate to one another. Right? So I'm not going to try and compare different values of n here. That would be a mistake. OK. So in particular, I've got that the height process converges in the almost sure sense. Uh, so this is 2 on sigma times the e. OK, so the two I want there and the sigma I'd like to move over the other side. So let's actually immediately do that. OK, so this is why I want my graph distance to be sigma on square root of n times the graph distance, because that's going to be the right thing to do in order to get the factor of two out the front. OK, so let's define a correspondence and a coupling. And really, I'm again just going to define a correspondence and then take the really natural coupling, which is just pick uniformly. <laughs> OK, so let's do that. So the correspondence is going to be called R, as usual. So I'm going to take R to be. So remember the notation V0, V1, V2, and so on for me exploring my rooted ordered tree in lexicographical order of label. So remember, that's the order that corresponds to getting the height process. So the height process is simply for, so height process at time i is simply how far is vi from the root. OK, so with those labels, so these are the so vertices of the tree in lex order. OK. So let me look at the label floor of nt, where t is going to be some value between 0 and 1. OK, so as t varies in 0, 1, this is going to give me all of the possible labels for v between 0 and n minus 1. Okay. And then similarly, what do I want to do here? Well, I want to pick a point in the Brownian tree and I'm going to do that again in the most natural way imaginable. I'm just going to ask, where does the point t in 0, 1 project onto the tree? Okay. So let me exclude one here just to make things a bit simpler. Right. So I've only indexed v 0 up to vn minus 1. And this ensures that I'm not picking out a v that I haven't defined. OK. So. Let's just check that that is a correspondence. So firstly, let me observe that I haven't lost anything here because, you know, the, the point one is always in correspondence with the point zero, right? So they get identified in the limit, so I've not lost anything. Um, and every other point is clearly getting picked out somewhere here. So every point on the left is clearly in correspondence with something on the right and vice versa. OK. So, and let the coupling... So I suppose there ought to be an n on here somewhere. So let's let this be rn. And this is the coupling new n. OK, be the law of, well, again, I'm going to do the natural thing. I'm going to take a uniform random variable between 0 and 1 and just pick out the relevant things each side. So uh, the law of, so v, floor of n times capital U and pi to e of u. Okay, uh, where u is just an independent uniform random variable, independent of everything else. 
So again, this is sort of my definition of the measure mu on the Brownian tree. And this is clearly just picking out v0, v1, up to vn minus 1, each with equal probability. OK, so somehow that's the, the most straightforward thing to do. So let me say that the two marginals are straightforwardly the right uniform measures. Okay, and moreover, we've cooked things up so that we don't actually put any probability mass outside the correspondence. So the term, you know, what's the new n measure of our complement? That's just going to be zero. Okay, so note new n of our complement is zero. So that means that the GHP distance between these two objects with this or can be bounded above by half the distortion of this correspondence. And we're very nearly there. OK, so GHP distance is bounded above by half the distortion of Rn. OK, so that's all we need to work out. OK, so let me fix values s and t, which are in the interval 0, 1. And again, for definiteness, let's suppose that s is the smaller of the two. And what do I want? So I'd like to think about the difference between sigma on square root of n times the graph distance between v floor of ns and v floor of nt. OK, so those are two sort of points in the left-hand space. OK, and I want to compare that to the distance in the Brownian tree between the corresponding points. OK, so because I'm thinking about points in 0, 1, this is the tilde distance. This is before I project it onto the tree. OK. OK, so we compared this at the end of the last lecture to something involving the height function or the height process now in this random setting. So let's immediately do that. So I can bound this above by, I've got this pesky factor of sigma on square root of n, but let me put that out the front. So then we said that this looked very much like well, think about the distance from the root to this point plus the distance from the root to that point minus, well, twice the distance to the most recent common ancestor. That gave us an exact result. And then we said, well, that wasn't far off the minimum of the height function between the two points. OK, so this is this thing plus mt. So that's the distance between the root and this point vns. This is the distance from the root to the point Vnt. OK, minus twice the minimum between those two points. So let's say k and t. Uh, this is Hn of k. OK, so one, that's one term. I'll put the error at the end. So hold it in your head so that there's something missing for the moment. This distance here is just by definition twice the Brownian excursion at s twice the Brownian excursion at t. And then because I'm minusing, I've got plus. Uh, and so I need twice the infima of the function between, but I've also got this factor of 2 in front of the, the Brownian excursion. So this gives me a 4. OK, so I've got that. And then not to forget the error term, I get a 2 sigma on square root of n. OK. So I'm about to send n to infinity. So the error term is clearly going to vanish. OK. And so 
I can just bound this whole thing above by 4 times the supremum over the whole of 0, 1 of, well, sigma on square root of n, hn of n times u, minus twice e of u, okay, plus again this little error. Okay, so this was by precisely the analogue of something I left as an exercise in the previous chapter when we were comparing our trees that were coded by different functions h and h prime. This is precisely the analogue of that, the fact that this difference is also bounded by the supremum of this distance. Okay, and this is uniform in S and T now, this bound. Okay, so in particular, this is uniform across all of the points that I've put in correspondence. Okay, and this converges to zero almost surely on this particular probability space that I've chosen as n to infinity, so uniformly in S and T. Okay, so this is the beauty of being able to use Skorohod's theorem here, is that I can actually make these comparisons so directly, rather than having to think about these as objects in distribution. I can actually think about putting them all on the same space. Okay, so in particular, the GHP distance between these two objects, let me just write this like this. So this goes also almost surely to zero as n goes to infinity on this particular probability space which is what we needed to show. Okay, so that's how the GHP bit of this goes. And I think you'll agree that once we've got these functions set up correctly, that's relatively straightforward. So all that remains to be done is to get between the Wachowskiewicz path and the height function. And I'll do that tomorrow.